extremely active member of the internet governance community. She is, um, you might, I think she's the leader or the head uh, director of the South School of Internet Governance, uh, which is one of the one of the main institutions um, of capacity building in Latin Latin America for internet governance. Uh, I will read her her curriculum. It is quite impressive. Dr. Olga Cavalli is a widely known professional for Argentina, America, and Europe. She is an electric and electronics engineer by profession and has vast experience in telecommunication, project management, market research, competitive analysis, public policy, and regulations. She holds a multitude of positions in the world of ICT, including high-level work with ICANN, the South School of Internet Governance, ELAC, higher education, and elsewhere. Dr. Cavalli has acted as a pioneer for women in technology and engineering since entering the male-dominated field and is currently the pre president of the Women in Technology and in Business Forum and the founder of the National Center for, of Engineers, Women Engineers for Development Commission. Uh, Dr. Cavalli is Argentina's GAC representative at ICANN. That's the General Advisory Committee. It's where all the national represent representatives gather in the ICANN. She is also the nominating committee's app appointee to the G GNSO, that's a gen generic name supporting organization, where she represents the Latin American Caribbean region. As you can, as you can see, Olga has quite a curriculum and a vast wealth of experience in internet governance. And it's an honor to have you here. Thank you, Gustavo. I'm muted. No, no, no. no. Thank you very much. That, that's too much for me. And I'm, I'm very honored to be with you. It's funny because my daughter, she's 25, and she said, what kind of training is for you that Saturday night, mom? This is very strange. I said, well, well internet is like that. And this time of, 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 of confination that we are having now, um, it's okay. Thank you very much for, for having me. I have, uh, I'm honored to be with you. I think that the youth is sick uh, and all the youth like IGF are doing, you're doing a great job. And I was present, I, pre I was preparing the presentation today and reviewing the dates. And I remember that those who were founders of the internet, we will review that in detail in a moment. They were very young when they did this great uh, technology development. And you are very young. They were in their 20s and the university. I usually take this, this concept to my students. I say, hey, you're in your 20s. You're in the stu students at the university. See what these people did. I hope to find you in 20 or 30 years. And you tell me, hey, professor, look what I, what I invented. And this changed the world. Maybe. Why not? So Vint Cerf, Tim Berners-Lee, all these people, they were very young 50 years ago, 40 years ago. And they did this fantastic uh, development that allow us, allows us now to communicate, to learn, to be in contact with our families, to develop some kind of uh, economic activity. Not all of them, but some of them are really growing now. Not, unfortunately, not all of them. So have that in mind. You have uh, the whole world and the whole life in front of you. So use that opportunity. Uh, so um, tell me, should, are you going to, so this person, I prepared this presentation for you. Uh, as Gustavo said, I'm an engineer. So I, I, I had, I had a look at the material that you already have from ISOC and I decided to, to change the scope a little bit and make it a little bit more focused on technology, which is what I know better. And, um, and, and, and also um, review the history and concepts related with internet. I understand that you already had a um, presentation by Tracy Hawkshaw uh, about the internet ecosystem. I may touch some concepts about that uh, because I think it's relevant for the context, but um, it's mainly uh, concepts about uh, history, principles, and, and um, technology involved. So, um, okay. should I change it or will you change it for me? 
Oh, perfect. So what I did first is I, I included uh, this timeline that I think it's very useful because it's a very complete timeline. There are two slides about the timeline that starts with the invention of the telephone, which I think a telephone or telegraph in, in late in, in the like two centuries ago, at late uh, 19th century. And the, and the development of the telephone system is early 20th century. What happened with the telephone? It, it allowed uh, the interconnection and the development of different networks all over the world. I will show you other map in a moment. So in spite of the fact that it's not really related with the internet now, it, it established the way that the, the world started to be interconnected in between different regions, in between different countries. So that was the start of a journey that we are profiting from today. Uh, the first computer was invented in early the, the early years of the 20th century. Early computers were totally different than we know today. So this phone could be considered a, a, a computer because it has all the features of a computer. At that time, computers could fit into a big, big, big room because of the technology used. Um, but that was the starting point of uh, the way to analyze and process data. Uh, that happened in 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 year in the 30s uh, of, of the past century and um and then something happens in 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 uh, at the middle of last century which is the invention of the solid electronic uh, so all, all the things that you have today everything that you have today that works with electricity has some um built circuits that use um um, silicon to be constructed, which is um, sand. It's, it's a very, very common um, material in our world that uh, it's the part of the, of the circuits of today and before that didn't exist. That, that really changed the size of all the devices that we use today. And that made us go to the next step. Can we change the slide, please? So in the second one, um, you see, um, the first PC, the personal computer, appears at, at the beginning of the 80s or late 70s. Before computers were big, and we used to, I used to work with that when I started my my first um, stages of my career. The computers were big, and we used a small terminal, something like the internet today. The concept is similar, but the first PCs started to appear in in the 80s, and the internet. The protocol, the TCPAP protocol, is developed by Windsurf and Bob Kahn and their friends in the in the UCLA in '74. So it's it's quite quite an old and, and remarkable successful um, protocol. So at this time, and then uh, the World Wide Web by by Tim Berners Lee is developed the HTML and and the navigation of the internet as a concept starts in the '90s. So as you can see, the internet has a quite um, young story, uh, but it has really changed um, a lot our lives. If you have time and you're interested, the, this has a lot of details about the evolution of technology in, in the modern world in the, in the last century. So I think if, if you really want to investigate or use it for research, this is a very interesting timeline developed by the United, the United Nations. Um, so let's see and, and go more in, in detail about, about the internet and how can we uh, uh, review its evolution. Can, can we go to the next one thing? So uh, there is a, for me, there is a, there is a very important um, inflection point in the history of the internet is when the Time magazine uh, includes a computer in its in its um, in its very famous year um, issue that includes the time, the person of the year. In spite of the of putting someone, uh, you see the the other two um, that I included there are the protester that was in the Arab Spring in the uh, in the year after the the, the 
the one that I'm showing, the pictures that I'm showing you there. And then it's Mark Zuckerberg. And let me tell you in a moment what was that about. That was the year where, when YouTube exploded. That was 2007. And at that time, um, I think it's an inflection point because at that time, the internet connection, it becomes to be more, um, not asymmetrical, before it was, I am seated in my computer, I type a URL and I, I, I receive information. And at that moment, that everything changed. We started to upload videos, we started to upload pictures. So uh, the Time Magazine reflects that big change in, in this issue of, of their magazine in 2007, that was the explosion of YouTube when, when Google buys YouTube and, and everyone starts to upload videos. Then uh, the other two are interesting because they are also related with the internet. See the one of the protester. You know the Arab Spring and internet and uh, and the um, social networks and the messaging uh, using mobiles had a very important um, role in in the development of this of, of this protest and the changes political changes that were very uh, impressive in, at the time in the arab countries so i would say that that also had a relationship with the internet and the other one is even more interesting is the face of um mark zuckerberg when he when, when facebook starts to be the the um um, social networks that everyone wants to be, that's 2009 or 2010. There was a discussion about which person would be the one in that issue. And the first candidate for that was um, Julian Assange. Uh, it was the time of WikiLeaks and all that explosion of uh, information that, that was published by WikiLeaks everywhere. And But then they, they, they thought it was going to be very controversial, so they decided Michael Zuckerberg. So you see the influence of the internet and the influence of people using the internet, social networks, the protester, or even YouTube, becomes the, the protagonist of the year in Time magazine. I think it's, it's an interesting inflection point in the history of the internet. Can we go to the next one, please? So this is a map. I just grab it a minute ago from Telegeography. If you're interested in connectivity maps all over the world, uh, Telegeography is, is a nice source. Of course, this map, um, they sell them. Uh, they are not uh, cheap, but they have some versions that you can grab from the internet uh, for free, or there are some versions that are for educational purposes. So I, I usually go to their website and have um, take a, a copy of them. And there is also uh, another map from ITU, which is brand new, and it includes also some other information uh, about internet exchange points. So if, if you're interested, I can share with you the link. So what I'm trying to tell you is that since that day that the telephone was invented and the telegraph was invented in late uh, 19th century until today, which is 150 years approximately, the world is totally wired. And see, and, and see the, 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 the impressive amount of uh, submarine cables in between Europe and, and the east coast of, North, of the United States and North America, and then all the cables going to, to Asia. Latin America is not so much connected. There is no cable going around Patagonia and Chile. And, uh, Many cables are around Africa. So um, the world has been wired, uh, heavily wired, much more in the Northern Hemisphere than in the South because these services go where the market is. It's like planes. It's, it's very similar when you see the roads of the planes. It's quite similar. You, you planes don't go to places that nobody will take the plane. A uh, plane goes to places where people take planes. And well, now we cannot take planes, but that will change soon. I hope. Um, so, um, and this, this connectivity has, has also been related with the development of the internet, accessibility of the internet, affordability of the internet. We will try to see some of these concepts in, in this hour that I'm sharing with you. But if you really are interested in maps, telegeography, it's a nice, a nice source to, to go and grab some information. Um, can we go to the next one, please? 
So, um, think that if we would like to be connected through a network, and Gustavo has a computer, I have a computer, and uh, Flavio has a computer, and Benjamin has a computer, and okay, we will, we will lie a cable in between each computer. That would be extremely, extremely inefficient and extremely expensive, and we couldn't even walk in our homes because all the wires would be in the floor. So the concept of the internet is the following, not this one, which is not nice. The concept is the, the following slide. You see, all the computers are connected to a single uh, connecting cable, which is a cable really. And all of them has a computer, a specialized computer called router in one point that, uh, represents or manages all the information of that of that network that network of course extremely simplified could be your isp could be my isp so at home in, in argentina i use an isp that it's called fibertel so fibertel could have all this this network of course it's much complex it's a big it's a big isp they have like one million um, customers but conceptually is the same. They have one router that looks into the word, looks to the word. So this helps the connectivity of all these computers. And there is one specialized computer that will gather all the information of this network and will connect with others. Let's go to the next one, please. So you see, this, this, these routers are interconnected in between them and the different networks are facing this group of routers and they interact among them. This is how internet works. So this, one of these different networks could be one ISP, could be also a big, uh, for example, a big network from a ministry or a big network from a big company that they would have their own network and, and their own router connected to the internet. So each local network is connected through specialized computer that will manage or that will give a road to the information that it's uh, packet switched so the information is cut in packets in small packets that to be addressed in the right way they have to it's like a letter that goes to your home if i want to send a letter to gustavo who is in nice natal i i would write an envelope with the right address so if the address is wrong, it won't get to Gustavo in Natal, it will get to another city in beautiful Brazil. So uh, the, this address is the IP address. And of course, I want to know who sent it. So I have both IP addresses, the address of the sender and the address of the receivers. So that's the main, the main content of one packet of the internet, of the information of the internet, the two IP addresses and some information inside. Some other details, but the, con the general concept is done. So this is how internet works. Um, can we go to the next one, please? So with this concept, these people, these brilliant people in their 20s, they thought that they could invent a way to, um, to packetize a, a protocol that packetized the information, put it in small pieces that could go in any direction um, it, it is not important which circuit or which connectivity that packet would would select if in any way that that road that the packet selected is wrong it could very easily be changed by other router that's a big change between the communications until that moment how were communications until that moment until the 70s or the 80s it was the telephone system if I call Gustavo or if I call um, Flavio by telephone, I can do that now and I call them. Oh, expensive, but I can do. Type of number, beep, 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 five, five, blah, 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 call. In that moment, Gustavo or Flavio will have with me a circuit that will be assigned for us during all our conversation. And that is a hierarchy structure organized through numbers. The numbers, the numbers of the telephone system are very important. Uh, but if that circuit is cut, our communication will be lost. The internet doesn't work that way. The internet works in a way that the packet tries to find a way to find the address that has to go 
and goes through different routers. If that connection doesn't work, very easily finds another way to find it. So the concept of the communication of the internet is totally different. This is the, the, the beautiful concept of the TCP IP protocol. So this picture is nice because it's not when they were so young. They are not, as you can see, they are not in, a, in their 20s in the picture. They might be 40s or 50s. And it's Vint Cerf in the right. In the middle is Steve Crocker. Steve Crocker was also their mate at the university. And he was for some years the um, director of the board of ICANN. And he is very well known and respected professional related with, with the history of the internet. And in the left, the, the man with the beard is John Postel. John Postel, uh, is, unfortunately, he's, he's, he's dead. Um, he died quite young, but Crocker and, and Vint Cerf are still on, on with us. And uh, Vint Cerf works for Google. So this is their definition. Uh, what is internet? It's the largest network of networks. So what I show you there is how internet is built. Different networks, totally different. Different ownership, different technology, different infrastructure. They can have 200 customers, 5 million customers, doesn't matter. All these independent networks are connected, are glued through some specific um, critical internet resources that I want to review with you. It runs on any communication substrate. They could be fiber optics, it could be microwave, it can be satellite, it can be mobile telephone, it can be wireless. So no need, no, in, no dependence on, on technology about the infrastructure and uh, uses a, a group of, of protocols that were developed around the concept of the TCPIP. The beauty of the picture that I was telling you is that the picture, uh, as you can see, it has uh, different color zucchinis in each of them, and this is a, uh, a piece of wire or something like that. So that shows that the infrastructure can, can have any, any technology, could be fiber optic or wireless or whatever. So, and they and in and, and the back they have the world they have Europe North America Latin America is behind Street Crocker this is um, Africa and Asia and Australia so it's uh, it's a, I think it's a Time magazine or, or but not the time of the year uh, the person of the year but one one important uh, picture um, so that's the the main concept of how the internet works is totally different from telephony. It's a, it's a different concept. So how many ISPs are in Latin America in the world? Millions. In Argentina, we must have, I don't know, 2,000. Brazil, I can't imagine, many more. All of them, different companies, different ownership, could be state-owned, private, consortia, whatever. Different technology, you don't tell. But you feel, we all feel now that we're connected in the same network. That's the beauty. And that's interesting also because the, uh, the, the power or the, the management is distributed in, in the ecosystem that you reviewed with Tracy the, the last week. So that's interesting because it's not captured by only one power. That could be perhaps dangerous. Can we go to the next one? So it looks like that. Uh, it's a kind of chaotic. I, I couldn't. I couldn't. Nobody could do a map of the internet. We could do a map of the country. We could do a map of the telephone system, but we couldn't do a map of the internet. Nobody knows because there are so many companies and so many technologies and so many places, and it's growing in the borders all the time. So it looked like that. Very chaotic, but very nice at the same time. There is beauty in chaos in this case. Can we go to the next one, please? So it's like that. All networks connected through a single protocol, single group of protocols, because it's a, it's a suite of protocols. Uh, routing tables of these computers, specialized computers called routers, and um, the IP addresses, which are a very important part of all this, all this system. Uh, IP addresses that are managed by the RARs. I will tell you about that in a moment. 
So it looked like something like that. And they're all interconnected, not in a hierarchy way. They're all interconnected through routers that routers know about the routers in nearby, no more than that, in these tables that are shown in, up there. Can we go to the next slide? So something like that. Um, here comes another concept, IP addresses. I just wrote some IP addresses of the old IP addresses, IPv4. Now there are new IP addresses, IPv6, because the IPv4 are, are totally used. Um, and here comes another concept. This is the uh, domain system. system. The domain system was, uh, was created in 1983 with the purpose of uh, using it to identify websites and other things in the internet. It's impossible that I remember this these numbers. It's, they are long and, and not even think about the IPv6. They are long and they have two points and, and, and and letters and impossible to remember, but it's easy to remember a name and uh, uh, something that reminds me of uh, university, my, my project, uh, with the school we have, governanceinternet.org, or my university is, is University of Buenos Aires, uh, .edu, and so that's easier. Behind that, there is always a new IP address, but people remember more a name. It happened to be that this, uh, these domain names have a marketing value, and that's quite interesting. So they can be, you can buy them for about 10 US dollars a year, around that some others, uh, some are more expensive, but you can go to the secondary market and buy them for much more money than that maybe millions of dollars, depending on which is the beautiful name that someone registered and could sell. So that, that is allowed, and it is called secondary domain name um, market. Um, can we go to the next slide? So um, what did people envision at that time? Uh, Vince Cerf, as I said, and Bob Kahn, his, 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 his pal at the university in, in the 70s, they created this TCP IP protocol, this packet switching, using packet switching technology that was already been used before uh, in the 60s. So the concept of packet switching already was, was experienced in, in the United States. And then Tim Berners-Lee invents the surfing of the web. So it, it both, sometimes people get confused about the two different things. So once the TCP IP and the routers and all that is, is invented, <clears throat> then comes that on top and let me surf into different uh, websites and, and review different information, which is how we navigate today the, the internet. That's what Tim berners invented, but much later, like 15 years after in the 90s. So all these people work in a very interesting way open standards imagine how the internet would have evolved if we could pay for the for the for all these protocols how much it would cost if there were not open standards how difficult it would be if they were not uh, developed by a group of technicians that are totally open which is what happens now in the ietf so if you're interested in developing these protocols and just join the ietf you don't have to pay you can do everything online and you, you can do your own contributions. It's not easy, I know, and it takes time, I know. You have to speak English, I know. But the possibility is there. That doesn't happen with many protocols that have been invented in, in the world, not even talking about these vaccines that are being developed now for the, for the virus. I mean, those are things that ha are, are heavily regulated and not so open. That means that people have to pay different kinds of fees if they want to use them. So the open technical standards for these people were paramount, were very important. The, the concept of freely accessible uh, processes for, for this development, the transparent and, and co cooperative governance. You cannot build a, world, a worldwide network without this cooperative concept. See, think about all these networks, thousands, millions of networks connected all over the world. They don't know each other, but they work together. 
What, what is like in the world today like that? Nothing. Uh, thousands of networks with different ownership and different technology working together as one without even knowing them, without even sitting together in a Zoom room like we are doing now. So that's, that's really remarkable. So this is based on open and accessible uh, standards and cooperative governance and this distributed control. So there's no one controlling. The control is distributed. This is complex. This is the basis of the internet governance concept. And this is why it's so difficult to define and to, and to control and to explain. So as I said, the, the packet switching was experienced in the 60s. And the first packet switching network in the United States was the ARPANET. ARPANET was the, the, the mother, the previous mother of the internet. And then came the World Wide Web. Can we go to the next one, please? Uh, Olga, if I can yes. make a comment. Sure. Uh, so I, I got involved with internet, internet governance two years ago. That's when, I, that's when I went to the South School of Internet Governance. And uh, actually, it was a bit longer, but I went to the 2017 uh, class. And, so, and, and Rio, in, in Rio de Janeiro, Rio yes. I missed yes. that. My, my mother was sick. I couldn't go. Yeah, well, yes, I remember that. It, it, but one of the things I struggled to understand about governance at first was the domain name system. And that is a thing which I, I, I've seen a lot of beginners in governance struggle with because it is very hard to understand the scale and the importance of this very simple thing. Um, it goes down to a very psychological thing. Yeah. We humans have such a hard time remembering numbers. So out of a necessity of something which is more memorable, we created a domain name system, and then there are the top level domains. So that's .br, .com, .ar, .jp, and so on. And this created the whole ecosystem of organizations offering domain names. And that was one of the strongest group of organizations that advanced governance. So it is it, all of that. So much of what we are doing today is just an emergent property of something very, very human which is we have a hard time remembering numbers. I know. Who, who knows numbers today? When I was a kid, everyone knew the telephone number of their friends, boyfriend, relatives. Nobody knows numbers here. And now they are all stored in our devices. Um, I, I almost don't know any telephone number now. So it's a DNS. Is the mobile, it's WhatsApp. We are always trying to set aside the difficulty of remembering numbers. And I don't know if it happens to you. Uh, I, when I have to count, I have to do it in Spanish. It's very difficult for me to manage numbers in, in, not in my mother tongue. And it's, 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 it's crazy, but it's like that. So there must be something with numbers in, in our minds that is, um, is making us finding these ways to, to simplify things, which creates a totally different industry. I will go into, into those details in a moment. So this is the, the, what was ARPANET, which is the, the predecessor, predecessor, predecessor of the internet. And this is how it looked in 1989. So that is uh, the, the year that the Mer Berlin Mauer was destroyed and the year that my son was born. So it's 23rd, 21 years, 31 years ago, sorry. So as you can see, there are some notes. It's not the first map, it's, it's quite evolved, this one. Um, it has some notes that are the same uh, notes where the, um, um, sorry, uh, where the, um, oops, the, root servers are located, the, the, the most important root servers in the United States, not the copy ones. I, I'll go into that in a moment. So um, this, this ARPANET was based, was organized by the Department of Defense, it was a defense uh, feature because at that time there was this Cold War with, the, with Russia, with the U Union, Union Sovietica, Soviet Union. 
And uh, at that time, the United States wanted to have this network that could be, that could find different ways to send the information if one way was attacked. That was the concept behind this packet switching. And uh, then it became a commercial issue before it was defense. Many things in, in, the, in the technology has gone from, from defense and war towards, towards uh, commercial issues. For example, the mobile telephone, as we know it today, was heavily used and proved in, the, in, in a war that it was in 1990 in Kuwait. Uh, at that time, the United States proved the, <clears throat> the telephone system, the mobile telephone system, that was not yet uh, implemented in, in, in the commercial phase. And then it became more popular. So many, many things like, uh, like the rockets to the moon, they were originally created by German engineers in the Second World War. And then those engineers went to the United States when Germany lost the war. So many of the advantages of technology from a commercial side started in a defense, uh, which is quite sad, but it is what it is, stories like that. So this network uh, was the predecessor and they used the TCPIP network and uh, this idea of the DNS is, is starts in the early 80s by John Macapetris, he was his inventor. And then this was called the NSAFNet and ARPANET didn't exist anymore. But this is the previous internet. Can we go to the next one please? So, uh, this is a little summary of what we have been doing. The difference between internet and, and telephony is that internet uses a, a mesh technology. This is not a single way to connect two points. If this way is not working, then the mesh finds a, another way, which is the best to be to connect. Uh, all the information goes in packets, a different from the from the telephony system that was working until then. And this, these packets travel independently in the network. So um, then uh, we have the, the development of the HTML over the, this packet switching infrastructure. Can we go to the next one, please? So summarizing what I have been saying, because it's starting to get confused. In the, in the 60s, uh, DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, creates ARPANET. As I said, it's the, it's the previous version of the internet requested by the Department of Defense with this concept of uh, the Cold War at that time. Um, then in the 70s, the, they had the notes I, I just showed to you, um, first in the West Coast and then connecting the West and East Coast. Then the protocol, uh, TCPAP protocol, is developed in, in the 70s, 74, uh, by Vint Cerf and, and Bob Kahn. And then 89, the creation of the HTML language and the World Wide Web in 1990. And then the Clinton administration, with a lot of vision, thinks that this will be the big thing. This will be an issue. and. Uh, uh, they create ICANN. ICANN had its uh, anniversary in, in the meeting in Barcelona that was in 2018, that was two years ago. And um, so that was 98, uh, 20 years. Uh, the, the, he creates this organization that is based in California, in the state of California, in, in Los Angeles. Now they have branches in other, other cities of the world, but it's legally based there, uh, which is a big issue in internet governance. And uh, they, they call it Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, so they will handle the IP addresses, the root servers, and the domain name system. So this is the, these are the main milestones of the internet history. Can we go to the next one, please? Sorry, I'm at home and my husband was talking this. That's, um, so all this, all this development that I showed to you, uh, all these people have worked with very strong internet principles that have, in my honest opinion, developed the way that internet is today. So it's a distributed um, network, coordination of networks that with a totally distributed um, management, there is no single control, there is no owner of the internet. 
there is no management, single CEO of the internet, but we all use it. And uh, we pay different pieces of it. We pay for content, we pay for the internet access. And there are some people that develop um, um, submarine cables and some others develop the local network. So all the, all the distributed parts are coordinated through some, some um, uh, critical internet resources, which I will go into in, in a minute. So um, the concept was, it has been growing to have global reach. Everyone should have it, not yet today, but hopefully one day, for anything that we want. Sometimes my mother, she's 88, but she's fond of uh, social networks and everything. She said, what can I do with my computer? I said, you can do whatever you want. What can I do with the internet? What can I find in the internet? You can find whatever information you want. So it's a general purpose. It's not a network only for something. It's a network that serves innovation. It has to be accessible, interoperable. I should use it with any kind of device and any kind of technology and anyone and no, no special. Today, we all want to use Instagram and then it was YouTube and then it, that may change. There is no, no, uh, permanent favorite in the internet. So this is kind, kind, it's quite interesting because if you think other inventions in the world, it doesn't happen. And it doesn't happen because they didn't have these principles at the beginning. These people had this vision that was really, really very revolutionary in my, in my opinion at that time. Think about the 70s, that's the 50 years ago. It's uh, for technology, it's a long time ago. Can we go to the next one? So IP addresses are uh, important to, to deliver the packets. Um, as I said, there are two types of IP addresses, four and, and six. Um, and uh, the protocol is good for communication. The IP address to identify where the information has to go and the domain and system is a reference to find information easier to remember for people, for humans. And remember the IP addresses have to be unique. So that's uh, the one has, that has the list has a lot of power. Can we go to the next one? So um, I think you reviewed already with, um, with uh, Tracy, but maybe, so I can and PTI. PTI is an, a new organization that was created after the IANA transition, which was a process that was organized in 2016. Um, they coordinate the DNS system and the IP addresses. IANA also is involved with the IP addresses and the, the TLDs. Then there are the CCTLDs, which are for countries. We are Brazil, AR Argentina, DE Germany. Then there are the generics, no country involved, other contract, other relationship with ICANN, very strong, totally different. Dot com, dot org, uh, dot info, the bees, many. Uh, registries are the owners of those G's, OCs, uh, very sign of Ilias, new star. And the registrars are those who sell them. There are smaller companies, well, not so small, though that is quite a big one, but there are other, there are intermediary companies that sell domains. And the ISPs are the ones that give us the, um, the connectivity and the carriers build the general infrastructure. So each of them has a piece of power. Each of them gets some money from, from the whole industry, but no one has the full control of all the issues. Can I touch here and go to the next one? No, thank you. So who, if we want to build an ISP, who would I go to get my IP addresses? Do I go to the supermarket? Do I buy them online in Mercado Libre? No, I have to go to a single place, which is our regional RIR. Our regional RIR in Latin America, for me and Gustavo and, and Brazil, it's LACNIC, which is, has, a, has an office in, Montevideo in Uruguay, and uh, you, you see that each uh, each uh, RAR has a, 
has this exclusive area. So they don't overlap. They don't overlap. Um, the Caribbean is divided into uh, Aden and, and Magnique, and then there's Europe, Middle East, and, and Russia, and uh, Asia Pacific, and Africa. So if you need IP addresses, you have to go to them. There's no other way, and you have to be a member of, them, of, of the organization. So these are they, are, they are coordinated by PTI. PTI is a part of ICANN that uh, was created after the uh, Diana transition, and PTI has a board, and they do this coordination in between the five RARs. Can we change the slide? So um, what, what is the role of ICANN? ICANN is not involved in content. ICANN, the, the mission of ICANN is make internet stable, secure, and, and, and resilient. And they manage the domain name system, they do the rules of the domain name system, and also the ruling of IP addresses and other parameters, for example, DNSSEC, which is very important for security of the DNS. Um, also the root servers. What is a root server? There was a time at home that once a year, a man from the telephone company come with a big book. That was the, the telephone guy. Sometimes I think that these root servers are the telephone guy. They have all the same information and they're updated once in a while during the day. They are a reference of the internet. They, are, they don't have a lot of, a lot of um, traffic, but they are the reference of all this information about the main name systems and IP addresses. Um, and I can does all the, these policies, they develop all these policies with a very interesting structure that I don't know if you will have a special uh, presentation from ICANN in the training course, I imagine that you will have. Can we go to the next one, please? Um, so this is the structure of ICANN. I won't go into details, it's quite complex, but uh, it's a multi, special multi-stakeholder. Special, I say, because stakeholders don't mix much, but uh, they are silos, but that's, uh, that's a different story. And uh, the thing is, that's quite open. If you want to participate, you can go to the meetings. Now it's virtual. The next meeting will be virtual. And uh, you can just register and participate in all the meetings. It's quite transparent. Not so simple to understand. It takes some time to get acquainted. But it's open. And then if you are really desire to participate, you can do that. Um, can we go to them? So I can manage the the root service. This is the original map of the 13 root servers. Uh, why 13? Why they're all in the States? Why they're all in the Northern Hemisphere? Well, it's that, that's because this is where the internet was created. And uh, what if someone puts a bomb in each of them and destroys the internet? Well, that won't happen because um, I will show you in a moment what, what is happening now. Uh, as you can see, the root servers have, they have a letter, they have an IP address, and they have an owner. Some, some are managed by, managed by private companies like the VeriSign, others are universities. Um, so it's, uh, there's no specific rule for managing of the root servers. And we can go to the next one, please. So there has been a project of copying, there are copies, the, co the root servers have the same information all of them, uh, they are reference servers and they are copies of the root servers all over the world. The first copy, for example, in Buenos Aires, in Argentina, was uh, brought, um, it's the F, the F server, came in 2008. It's, it was not very expensive, it's, 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 they don't have a lot of traffic, they are reference servers. And um, usually, LACNIC and the other RARs do promote the, the installation of copies of, there are more than 500, I think, all over the world. So that, that takes away the problem of the 13 bombs breaking the 13 root servers. And also the controversy of having them only in the United States, Japan, and, and Europe. Can we go to the next one? I think we're almost finishing. So. Uh, uh, what about the, the domain name system? And uh, conceptually, it's not easy to understand. Uh, so these are databases that matches resolve. This is how they call it. It's a resolve. It's resolve. They, they, they have one IP address, and the IP address matches one domain name. So these databases 
are differentiated in, in relation with the, the last part, what is called the top level domain, TLDs, whatever is from the point to the right. To the point to the right is a TLD. To the point to the left, it's up to the owner of the website, of the or domain name. I can, I can write whatever I want, whatever I register, if it's free, of course. But to the point to the right is what I can and Ayana assigns. And if you want to know all the list of all the TLDs, go to the ayana.org uh, website and they're all listed who's the owner, when they started, when was delegated, and everything. So that's easy to find. So the, the, you have the Gs, the generic, they are not related with the country, and they have some examples here. And then the, the country codes, CC is country code of level domain. They have a totally, those are totally different relationships with ICANN. Those generic have a very strong con, uh, contract and you can see them online. They're huge contracts uh, that establishes everything that the TLE has to comply with. The CCs don't have that relationship. They don't have to pay to ICANN by obligation. They can do that in a voluntary basis. And they are, the, the two letters come from an ISO list, the ISO 3166-1. Uh, some some um, CCs are used as GTLDs because they are nice for marketing, .tv, .me, .au, and others, uh, but that's an exception. Uh, they are still CCTLDs. Can we go to the next one? So uh, before uh, 2013, there were only 21 GTLDs, um, Cominfo, I don't name some others, and there were the CCs. So that was the scenario like eight years ago, but then I can um, went through a process of opening new GTLDs, uh, so there were like um, almost 2,000 requests and there must be 1,500 new GTLDs. And I have summarized them a little bit for you so you can have a sense of where, uh, where are we now and where are we going now from, from here. Uh, can we go to the next one? So uh, some were for cities. There, there were some requested for cities you see here. Uh, many cities in Berlin, Bayern, Colonia, Catalonia, Durban, Helsinki. So some others have different scripts, like uh, Cyrillic and Chinese and, and, and other, other scripts. And some of them are quite successful. And they're used for managing information of the city. And can we go to the next one? Those are, they were requested by Google. I. I haven't seen them used um, a lot, but that's uh, up to the company. They requested all of them. Um, so it's, uh, each, each um, request cost at least um, 180,000 US dollars. Uh, so it was quite expensive, plus the consulting and all that. But, so maybe in the future they, they will use it. And um, can we go to the next one? Many were used, were requested by brands. So these are some brands that requested. Uh, one, maybe you know that there was a long, long standing conflict that ended last year with that Amazon, um, that Amazonian countries uh, had a conflict with that. We, some of us supported Brazil in all that process, but finally I can, gave it to the company last year. Um, ICANN is preparing a new round of new GTLDs that may happen next year or in 2022. Uh, we will see. Uh, the first one was not as successful as expected. It was good for brands and for cities, but the rest are not profitable. So what is happening is that big companies are buying the small one or they are consolidating among them. We will see what happens with the next round. And uh, I think I'm almost finished. Uh, can we go to the next one? So if you want to know all about this, <laughs> you can download our book, 
which is uh, free for downloading and sharing. It's in Spanish, English, and Portuguese. We, we, we created it, uh, we edited it in, in honor of the 10th year of the South School of Internet Governance. Gustavo was in the uh, in nine, I think it was in, or eight, I don't remember exactly. Uh, uh, we were going to organize the 12th in Buenos Aires this year again as the first one in 2009, but we have canceled it until October because we were going to organize it in, in the university where I teach, University of Buenos Aires, but it's closed. We are doing everything online, so and people cannot travel, so we don't know. So the book is, is, is a thick book. It's, we haven't printed because it's uh, very expensive, very heavy, and not environmental good. Uh, but you can download as, as many copies as you want. And um, it, it covers uh, infrastructure, DNS, um, some other things like security, privacy. Vincent was the one writing the, the foreword, and also uh, we have um, contributions from many, many well-known experts in, in Latin America and in the Americas and Europe. So, uh, next one is the picture of the last school in last year in Mexico. So, if you're interested in the school, you're welcome to join us, follow us on, intern on social networks. That's a picture in Mexico in the Secretary of Economy. We had 200 students, Seven, uh, 70 of them, had, we could pay hotel and meals. Nobody pays for coming to the school. We pay as much hotels as we can, depending on the budget that we can gather. We had more than 100 uh, panelists. The same in Getulio Vargas, we, went, we had 105 experts during the five days. We have simultaneous translation. And uh, it goes, if you cannot come, you can follow online. Um, this year, it may, it may be virtual. We don't know yet. We, we don't know because the beauty of the school is how you interact, how you get connected with the experts, how you get connected in between yourselves uh, in, during coffee, during the breaks. After, before, we, we, we get to know you through Telegram groups. So it will be very different, different if we are not face to face, we gather together, but we will see. We will see what happens with this virus and this quarantine. So I hope I was not boring to you and I'm open to questions or whatever you want to ask. Uh, it was not boring at all. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, everyone, if you want, you can just take the mic and ask your question. If you're shy, that's okay. You can just write it out. Uh, if we get too many people, you can just click on the icon to raise your hand. And if no one, if no one asks anything, I have a few points I would raise. Okay. So anyone, here's your chance. Don't be shy. I'm, I'm not a teacher. I'm a, I'm a teacher, but not now. I want... Uh, <laughs> Let's see. I think I should have practiced my, my Portuguese, huh? Mm, well... What do you think? If you, if, you can, if you want to, that's okay. It's not necessary, but it's okay if you want no, to. No, but I see, I see many colleagues, many friends from, from Brazil. Maybe others couldn't follow. Well, while, while people might be writing their questions, um, there, is a, there is a thing which um, it, it is, I was thinking, and it's very useful to frame the internet as what some people would call a general purpose technology. Are you familiar with that term, Olga? Yes. Yeah, yeah. well, um, it's interesting your comment. I was thinking about that when I prepared the, the something is changing. Um, if you look at the internet today, it, it started to build some walled gardens. And I hope it, that this, this general purpose prevails, but, um, but it's, it's changing. Also, in, in, an important part of the traffic doesn't go through the internet today. It goes through some networks that deliver content directly to the internet exchange points. So 
I, I think that in general, the, the internet is changing. I think it's for the good. But at the same time, we have to be, you that are young and, and active, you have to be vigilant that this general purpose technology is, it, it prevails and that the, that the innovation also prevails. Um, what is happening now, I think, is this concentration of power in, in, very, in a very small group of companies that are buying other companies, which is, which is normal part of, 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 the, of a market, of an open market. I have seen that with, with telecommunications, with mobile telephony. So this is not new. But as the internet is different from a telecom company or a mobile telecom company that has an owner, has a board, has investors, this is different, so the, the, the control is distributed all over the network. I would love this to prevail and not to be, don't the power to be totally concentrated in in few companies, but that may happen. Um, so I hope that we, we have the principles that these pioneers had in mind when they created the, 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 the protocols, uh, that we, we keep them alive. And I think it will be like that, but we have to be vigilant and, and active in that. So, and you, you can play a, an important role in that. Um, I would ask more questions about this yeah, topic. Please. I'm very interested, but we got the first question. From okay. It says, regarding the IPv4 to IPv6 transition, in our materials, it was mentioned that it is necessary because of the shortage in IP addresses available. Is this already happening or is it still on debate? If it is, all previous architecture will need to transition to IPv6 or is it possible to maintain both protocols? Thank you. Uh, well, the, the IPv4 addresses, the main blocks were given to the RARs in 2012. That was the day that the main repository of IANA was gone. Then each RAR manage uh, to, to distribute them through some time and finally they, I think like Nick, uh, finished their pool by, by some years ago. Now if you, if you request, they will give you only IPv6 addresses. IPv4 will remain for, because it's, it's the way that internet was built. So both protocols will, will work together. If you go to LACNIC uh, website, you will find many tutorials and how these two, because they are, they are different protocols and they are not compatible. So you have to manage to tunnel, tunnelize or double stack or there are different technologies or ways that, that make them compatible. Uh, but you won't be given IPv4 addresses now, they will give you only IPv6. What may happen is that you buy, for example, an ISP. You have money, you purchase a company, and they have IPv4 addresses. In that case, uh, LACNIC is aware of where are these IP addresses. So they, they have a who is database where then they know where the IP addresses are. And you have to inform them that the change of, of, of management of these IPv4 addresses. And they cannot be uh, they cannot just go to the market and sell them. It, you have to inform them, them and, and let them know. So there, there is uh, some level of control by, by the RARs in relation with the IPv4 and IPv6, but they were gone some years ago. Because, because of, uh, it's interesting because the, the, Vin Cerf was asked and when, he, when they developed the, the, the protocol, he said that, someone asked him why the, it was so long and it has so many, many IP, IPv4. And then with the mobile telephony and all the devices that are connected to the internet, that exploded and the demand exploded. So that those, those addresses were, were finished. I don't know if I answered, I think it, it is so previous architecture. Not, not all, all architecture will transition, they will be together. What you have to be in mind, if you're going to work in networks, to buy equipment that it's compliant with. Uh, so you have to be careful when, when you purchase. It has happened in some companies that they buy, and not now, but some years ago, 
that that they were not so much aware of that. So I, if you have any doubt, I suggest that you contact uh, um, LACNIC and they have a, a lot of information to, to give you. And they are very experts. Flavio has a question. Go ahead, yes. Flavio. Thank you. Uh, first, uh, Olga, it was a great presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks uh, to you. <laughs> well, um, where are you, Flavio? That looks nice. Where, where are you? Uh, where I am at home. This is a uh, oh, fake Oh, that's a fake. Oh, my God. My computer <laughs> is so old that I cannot then. put that. Yeah. Oh, okay. That looks very nice. Okay. Then you can have that in mind. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, I have a question. Is In general terms, I think in Latin America, we have a very uh, free internet. But... Do you know in any any sort of internet uh, control or uh, bad management from the governments in Latin America? Because I think we not that I'm aware. What, what, do you have that, inform that information? I think hmm. I interrupted you. Sorry. Uh, sorry, sorry. It's, it's like a, I think we have a very uh, in terms of internet freedom, we have a lot of internet freedom right here in Latin America, but I think there, there maybe there be uh, any sort of limitation. I'm, I'm not aware of, of any, especially from the governments. I think we are quite open and free. What is happening now with this uh, quarantine and the virus is what I feel uh, this controlling where people is going and this G your localization. I'm afraid, and maybe I'm, I hope I'm wrong, I'm afraid that this will remain after the virus. And, and we have fought so much. I mean, you're young, but previous generations have fought so much for freedom and for, for personal freedom that I'm afraid that we may lose some of them with this controlling because of the health, because of the virus, because of security. Also happens with security, you're losing privacy. But that's, uh, that's what's happening. So we also have to be vigilant about that. And uh, there are some, some applications that uh, some of them may May get to know where are you, where are you going, and maybe it's not a controlling of the content, but it's perhaps controlling where you are, where you go. Um, so that seems to me a little bit frightening. If if it's used for health care, that's okay. But my fear is like the taxes. I don't know if in your country, in my country, when they create a tax. They say it's temporary, but then it's forever. And then they, they start to add other taxes. And so finally you pay a lot of money. So I hope I'm wrong, but we have to be vigilant and we have to fight for our freedom, which is, I think after breathing and, and drinking is the most important thing that we have. So we have a question from Benjamin. Benjamin, do you want to take the mic? Thank you. I'm glad to see you, Olga. Hola. Pleasure to listen. Where here. are you from, Benjamin? From no, Mexico listen. City. I, I was see. in. I can, I can check so, the accent. <laughs> I, I I was in Sur School. Ah, uh, bien. Last year. Okay. Uh, my, my question is: Now, uh, internet work with the protocol TCP, and uh, we can work with uh, clear principles and invarieties of internet. But it, it, it is possible to use these principles and invarieties of internet if, the, if in the future there are another protocol? Depends on who makes the protocol. That's a good question. Yeah, and maybe you have seen this, this uh, project from China. They have this called new IP. Uh, it's a, they, they say it's a new protocol and... Um, they will present it in the next ITU meeting. Um, what, what, they, what they say about this protocol, they say this TCPAP, it's a protocol that has like 50 years old, which is true. And that, that the new technology that is being developed and installed is 5G, um, self-driven cars, 
uh, all the Internet of Things mixed with 5G. Um, you know, 5G has different um, different speeds and bandwidth. So there is, if you want to watch a 8K quality video on your mobile, you will be able to. But then there are other services that have less bandwidth but very high speed. So those are intended to be for self-driving cars and things connected to the internet, not person, things that need a very high speed to respond to their, to their purpose. For example, you want the car to, to stop at the red light and not kill people. So you need a very quick response. What they are saying is that this protocol that we are using now is not prepared for that technology. I haven't seen any technical document. I have seen only presentations that are very general. I don't know if, if these protocols will be built with an openness concept, with a decentralized concept, with a open open process for developing or, or renewing the, the content. Honestly, I, I have no idea. That may happen. And uh, we will have to be also prepared to handle that. Uh, I'm, I'm not saying that, it, that it's a wrong idea to have a different protocol. I mean, um, the, the thing is, thing is, thing is controlling the content is people don't like that. But from a technical point of view, it could be another protocol, but it's more suitable for, for this high speed response. That, that, may be, that may be possible. I'm not saying no. But there is this fear that one country will have this protocol to control all the information and all of us. We'll see, have to see how it evolves. Uh, but we, we, you, can, we can check on, online what, what, when they have more information or what they present in, in the ITU meeting in, I think it's next year. So Olga, I got a little memo here. Um, you, I was asked to invite you to our upcoming webinar on about the topic of COVID, of coronavirus. Oh, so, when is it? Um, let's see. I think Eileen or Pedro, may, they can get the date. Uh, there is a point about this, about what you just mentioned, about this Chinese-made possible protocol. Um, I have looked at it, but I, I had been discussing it with some people from ISOC Brazil, and the comments I got was that it was technically flawed to a very deep degree. Uh, so yes, th th I would say that is one of the more interesting discussions that can happen. Uh, we'll see how it goes. Uh, I haven't seen inf technical information about it, so honestly, I cannot. I cannot say what what I, I what I can say is we shouldn't be totally neglecting. A different development. I mean, there may be other technologies coming in the future. There will be new computers, uh, quantum computers or whatever. So that will happen. And that doesn't mean that we have to say, no, 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 because it's new. Also, everyone is saying, oh, but the internet works fantastically today. Yes, but we, I don't have a self-driving car today. I don't know if it's working okay or not. So Honestly, we're talking about things that are not yet in place. Uh, can you talk about the recent, conf what does it say? Uh, Pedro says, can you talk about the recent controversy about the private equity firm tried to buy the .org? <laughs> Gracias. <laughs> you say not for profit. Uh, would it be possible to keep it uh, the main out of the profit economy? Uh, yes, I can tell you what I can say. You know, I'm a board member of ISO, so I cannot tell you everything. Part of the information is confidential. But uh, what happened is that um, the, they had the, this, this offer and the board has to, it's, we, we are, um, we must. We have a fiduciary obligation to find the best way for the sustainable, the economic sustainability of the organization, and that was seen as a as a good opportunity to sell the dot org and have a, an endowment. Endowment is like a money that you then 
put in and you get some. I'm an engineer. So all, all that part of economy is not good in my mind. But uh, maybe you, you can handle that better. Um, so that money would go into an investment um, criteria and that would give uh, ISOC at the same revenue that would come from .org. Uh, what also happens is that uh, some, it is really, nobody knows what will happen with the DNS in the future because um, there is this idea that the DNS is not so used as before, that people are using um, social networks or apps and the mobiles and the, so some people think that domain names may be less used in the future and as the main revenue of the of isoc today is what the money coming from dot org in the future that would have uh, problems for sustaining the organization and paying these webinars, the youth, the chapters, and all that. So that was the idea behind the sale. Um, I had concerns, honestly, I can tell you. Uh, I expressed these concerns, but then the board decided that, and we usually work on consensus based. And then ICANN has just said that they won't, uh, they, they didn't say they won't allow, they use another legal expression but finally they said no somehow no um there was a very strong letter from the attorney general of california because our icon is based in california saying that they should not proceed with the sale so this so it stopped it, it won't happen uh that's the uh, any more questions did we skip some Webinar seven, June, uh, can, uh, um, can June you send that to me by email? Yeah, please, so I can put in my calendar. I want to ask a question. Sure. Sure. Where are you? I cannot see you. I'm Nathanael. Let me show myself. Nathanael, where are you? All right, I'm Nathanael. Here, Nathanael. Where are you? I'm from Brazil, Curitiba, South, Curitiba. south region of the country. Quasi Argentina. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the question I have is about uh, information. Uh, the information we provide to to the website, if uh, about ourselves, uh, the, our personal data, if it, it's uh, is there any kind of technology or or technology that manage this information, combining it with the domain name of the website we, that we are providing the information. Um, I'm not sure if I understand your question. Um, the information that we give, uh, we maybe give can you clarify? Can you, can you give me an example? Because I, I'm not sure if I, if I get your, your question. My question is uh, about uh, data management. Oh, I think I understood what Nathaniel is going for. So uh, if, I, if I understood it correctly, um, I could maybe change the question a little bit, which is how related is the domain name system to the data protection laws and data management and data collection? Uh, so those are two, I'm sorry, those are two reasonably distinct systems. Uh, domain, the domain name system doesn't really, if you go with ICANN, they don't usually deal with the content of what, what is being transmitted. Did that, no. Is that the, what you're going yes. for? As my question was about the content of the Not the, the content, but, but, but you make an interesting point, um, is the following. All, for example, if, when, I, when I register a domain name, there, there is information about myself, but before it was totally open. That is called the who is protocol. Who is, who is, can S, can S. Um, so before you could go into the database and see, for example, if I register governmentsinternet.org, you could go to who is, I can who is or other who is, and they point to the website, to the database and say, oh, Olga registered that, that day, and blah, 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 with that registrar. 
today, with the new GPRR, the, the new uh, European uh, law, um, regulation about privacy, that is not going to happen. That has some implications. Good for the privacy. What happens in, in some countries, uh, you can be punished for being homosexual, for example, or you can be punished for having a different religion. Luckily, it, this doesn't happen in this continent, which is good, but it's not the same all over the world. So this privacy related with the, with the domain registration is good, but at the same time, the people that are in charge of security prosecutors, lawyers, all the people that are, are related with security issues, they tell you, I need to know. I need to know who's behind that website because they may be phishing. They may be gathering information which is wrong. They may be sending wrong information about COVID or other things, uh, fake news. So I need to know who's there. So this, this is a big discussion. In ICANN, there is a group now uh, developing the new protocol that will handle that the change that was mainly driven by the Europeans, but as internet is all interconnected, it really impacts all, all, the, all these databases. So it's, a, it's an interesting question, Nathaniel. Um, not for the content, but yes, for the, the information of the registrant. That, that, that is something that we have to look what will happen with ICANN. Okay, thank you. Thank for the for your welcome. Do we have any more questions? Um, we are close to, to our scheduled end time. If you're shy, you can also send uh, the question through message. It's fine. Don't be shy. Okay, send me, send me the info by the webinar and the time so I can get in my calendar. I'm about to hit send. Okay. Yep, there it is. So, may, well, since no one is speaking up, um, there is a thing that my generation, we did not witness this, but around the 90s, the internet wall, was full of walled gardens. That's the term you used. Uh, and, and today, and I agree with you, today, so much of the internet is is again becoming akin to a, wall, to a series of walled gardens. Now, platforms play, play such a big role on the internet. Back in the 2000s, uh, if, you, if you pick your standard, your basic internet user, you, and you ask him how many websites you visit on average, their answer would be, I don't know, 20, 30. Nowadays, we use so, so very few websites because so much of our activity is concentrated into just a handful of platforms. Yeah, I agree. And that is, um, that is a big change. And uh, also that most of the traffic doesn't go through the internet. As I said, most of the traffic goes through private networks that the content development networks deliver directly to IXPs. And I'm not saying that's wrong, but I'm saying that parallel parallel worlds are being developed like the one that the mm -hmm. NASA found now that it's a, there is a parallel world that go backwards in time um, and uh, yeah I've, have you seen the, the news um, so that happens and uh, the, everyone seems to be in a social network but we can see that now uh, it was my birthday in March I have received messages by WhatsApp Messenger, Facebook, Telegram, email, they call me, Zoom. Everything is different. So at the moment, I say, oh my God, I, I, how can I handle all this? Because I, they are totally different words and totally closed in between them. So if you're in Facebook, you're, well, Facebook, Instagram, and WhatsApp are most of the same. But if you're in Telegram, you're not in the other one. And if you're in Messenger, you don't see the other one. So they are disconnected. They are wallet gardens again, like before the internet, like the, like the telephone system, like what we had at that time. So, but the world is like that. We go back and forth from different models. Well, everyone, I think we don't have any more questions. So if 
everyone's okay with it, we could actually end this meeting four or three minutes earlier. Uh, so, Olga, thank you so much for being here with us in this I Saturday was, night. I was delighted to be invited, and I think you are very brave to be so young and Saturday night talking with me. I'm honored with that. And uh, it's remarkable. So I commend you all for that. And thank you very much for inviting me. And let me know about other webinars that I can join, and I will be happy to join. Or anything, other thing that you want me to share with you or present, just let me know, and I can get organized. And I will be happy to do that. Thank you, Olga. And well, thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, well, as you can see, I had a lot of fun. I love this topic. I love these discussions. And I hope everyone had as, just as much fun as I did. Okay, me too. I, I had a nice time. I enjoyed it. And uh, be careful, be safe, resist, and see you somewhere in the world or online. So well then, bye everyone. Ciao. Ciao, ciao. Bye. bye. Ciao, ciao. See you around. <laughs>